Welcome everyone to um, another Kathy webinar lecture. So this week, we're really excited to hear from Professor Adam Holowinski from University of Colorado at Boulder. So Adam did his PhD at the University of Michigan and a postdoc at Georgia Tech. And the focus of his work is electrocatalysis for sustainable energy and uh, chemical production with a particular focus on biomass valorization, alcohol electrooxidation, and solid state batteries. And he's very interested in the fundamentals as are we. So he focuses on kinetics, spectroscopy, and also kinetic modeling. And he's been honored for his work with the prestigious NSF uh, Career Award. And so with that, I'll hand it all over to Adam. Thank you again for doing this for us. All right, well, thank you, uh, Karen, for the invitation uh, to talk here and the nice introduction. Uh, so, so today I'll be talking about some of our work in uh, electrocatalytic conversion of renewable feedstocks. And in this case, uh, I'm referring to some of the larger molecules uh, that we're gonna get from breaking down biomass. So just to start, from a really high level. Uh, I think we're all in this, this audience probably well aware of some of the concerns with, with CO2 emissions and climate change. And I'm not really gonna give that kind of talk today, uh, but uh, one of the findings from the recent IPCC uh, panel meeting was that we, we need to drive emissions to essentially zero, if not negative in the next 30 years or so, or we're gonna be facing some pretty severe consequences. And the thing I wanted to comment on is that renewables like solar and wind are gonna play a huge role in that, no doubt. Uh, but of course, these are intermittent sources of electricity and we need storage. Uh, beyond that, some of this storage needs to be chemical. So there are, there are certain uh, industrial sectors, economic sectors that are just gonna be very, very difficult to decarbonize. Uh, so in, in transportation and, and heavy industry in particular, uh, you can see down here. So the, the numbers I'm showing on the bottom left are for the United States, uh, but roughly probably similar distribution in, in a lot of other countries. Uh, you can see we're using about a third of our energy on electricity. And so that's more directly amenable to, to some of those uh, other renewables. But uh, about half the pie here is transportation and, and heavy industry. And even if we you know, electrify light vehicles, for example, that's really only about half the transportation sector. You've still got aviation and heavy shipping and things like this. Uh, and, and so if, if we need carbon-based fuels for the, at least the, the near term, uh, you know, we, we might get there from a sort of bottom-up CO2 and hydrogen kind of approach. Uh, or the other, the other direction we can think about going is uh, taking some molecules that already have a number of carbon-carbon bonds in them uh, and, and trying to convert these to, to fuels and chemicals with, with a few fewer steps. Uh, and so this is where biomass kind of comes in uh, as, a, as a carbon neutral option. And I'll, I'll mention here, we're, uh, we're talking about there's, there's a whole lot of different things that are classified as biomass. Uh, our, our main focus here today will be on uh, kind of dedicated energy crops and some of the, the compounds we get from those. Uh, there's also various like municipal waste and uh, algae and some other kinds of things. But um, the, the United States right now has done some analyses where we've shown that we could produce about a billion tons of biomass sustainably in, in the next decade. And what that would correspond to is about 25% of the transportation fuel demand. But if we considered electrifying half the fleet as well, that becomes a very significant portion of the remainder. Uh, so, you know, biomass is, is one technology in sort of a portfolio, but it's, it's gonna play a role, I think, uh, in, in the coming years, at least as a stopgap. Uh, so, if we want to think about changing feedstocks from what we've done in the past, I, I apologize that the structures on this slide are a little bit small. We'll uh, look at some of these in more detail shortly. Uh, but, but when we're working with petroleum-based feedstocks, we have uh, a collection of molecules that are, let's say, under-functionalized. So, so we've got hydrocarbons that are, are pretty good fuels to start. Maybe we do some distillation and some isomerization steps, but to get to gasoline and diesel and jet fuel, there's pretty minimal 
processing. To get to fine chemicals, now we need to install various functional groups and there's gonna be some more, more steps involved. Uh, conversely, if we were to begin with, with biomass-based feedstocks, now we're gonna find a whole collection of molecules that have a, a spectrum of different functional groups on these and we're gonna to have to do various hydrogenation and hydrodeoxygenation types of steps uh, to get these down to more saturated molecules that are gonna have uh, appropriate heating value and, and work as fuels. And then of course, to get to some of the commodity chemicals that we traditionally get from oil, uh, there will also be kind of new pathways that we need to develop. And uh, I'll mention that, that the, the economics of this have been investigated pretty thoroughly. So the, the National Renewable Energy Lab just down the road from me has, has a whole uh, uh, group that does just TEA essentially. And uh, they, they determined that we could do biofuels right now with current technology for something like $4 per gallon of gas equivalent, <coughs> dollar per liter if, if you prefer. Uh, that would be using hydrogen supplied externally, meaning probably coming from fossil resources and reforming. Uh, it's more like five to six dollars a gallon if you need to also get hydrogen from the biomass. And, and so the way that the economics on this can work, if we think about gas being half that right now, uh, is to basically offset costs with higher value co-products. And this is exactly what the petrochemical industry already does. So if we look at a barrel of oil here on the bottom right, almost half the value is coming out of just about 16% of, of the volume, right? So the, the numbers there are again US, but we do something like a, a trillion dollars a year in fine chemicals and commodity chemicals and another trillion in fuels, which are much higher volume, uh, low margin, uh, products. So uh, if, if we want to make biofuels work, we need to make the high value chemicals alongside the fuels. And, and that's going to be our, our focus today. Uh, just to draw a few more comparisons, uh, when, when we typically think about chemical synthesis, uh, we're, we're talking about starting from uh, crude oil, natural gas, you know, traditional fossil resources. And for, for finding commodity chemicals, we're talking about the lighter ends that we get from this. So uh, the stuff that's gonna come off the top of the, the column or things that are more prominent in natural gas. So our, our light alkane types of feeds. Uh, but basically we're gonna start with, with some of these light alkanes, intermediate alkanes. We're gonna hit them with a ton of energy. So we'll do steam reforming to make syngas. We'll do some cracking and reforming to get olefins and aromatics and things that are a little easier to, to functionalize. And then there's a whole kind of palette of, of partial oxidations that are gonna be done under different conditions and with different catalysts to get us to all of our functional groups. So our aldehydes, our acids, our alcohols, uh, so on and so forth, all the, the building blocks that can then go into larger molecules. And, and one of the reasons that we can do all of this as effectively as we do uh, really comes down to economies of scale and in heat integration. It's, it's the fact that we've got endothermic processes and exothermic processes all in the same place. Uh, and, and we can really take advantage of that uh, and, and borrow heat from one to run the other and so forth. Now, if we wanna to move to biomass-based feedstocks, uh, we, we run into some new problems. So, so when we're talking about our energy crops or waste or, or whatever uh, type of biomass feedstock we're interested in, we now have a distribution problem. Uh, these things are not gonna go into pipelines easily and, and be sent to centralized processing in the same way. Uh, we've got comparatively complex mixtures uh, so it's not going to be simple distillation uh, to separate our various components. And then we just have underdeveloped uh, conversion paths. So, you know, increasingly these chemistries are becoming established, but, but we haven't really built these on, on large scale and validated them over decades like we have with, with petrochemical processing. So uh, just to kind of give a, a little bit of an overview of, of where all the various streams go. 
and I'll, I'll highlight this uh, review article down at the bottom here. I was hoping it would be out before I gave the talk. Check ACS Energy Letters in about another week or two. Uh, but uh, what we're going to be looking at is uh, taking our, our biomass feedstocks, which uh, could be energy crops or, or forestry or agricultural residues, uh, could be algae if we're looking more at like lipid type uh, products uh, or food or municipal waste. Uh, but, but when we break these things down, uh, we're going to get down to the basic components, which are lipids, carbohydrates, proteins, uh, and, and within uh, the, the energy crop category that I'm going to be focusing on today, uh, we'll, we'll break that down a little bit more into the, the primary components of the plant matter, which are going to be uh, cellulose and hemicellulose, which are just polysaccharides, so lots of C5 and C6 sugars, and then lignin, which is going to be polyaromatic, a little tougher to break down, uh, but, but a source of some aromatic chemicals. Uh, so just for sake of completeness over here on the kind of lipid side, we can get to fatty acids and that's where we would make biodiesel. Uh, over here on the lignocellulose side, when we break down the cellulosic components, we'll get to polyols, carboxylic acids, some furanic compounds, lignin gets us oxygenated aromatics. And, and then what we're interested in is from some of these initial pre-processing steps, how to take all these different chemical platforms to the fuels, chemicals, and materials that uh, we are, are interested in making or replacing. So just to, to give a little bit more detail on the, the lignocellulose platform in particular, one of the more common ways to break this down is by acid hydrolysis. And the cellulosic components are going to depolymerize into sugars. So these are this is glucose and xylose here. Uh, and depending on the conditions, how, how harsh, what temperatures, how long you run it for, you can kind of optimize for sugars, uh, furanic compounds, which are gonna come from dehydrating those sugars. Uh, and then some those in particular, the one on the top here, uh, hydroxymethylferferal, are prone to continued degradation. And so then we'll get into some of the, the linear organic acids. So it's levulinic acid and formic acid down there. Uh, but, but so these are kind of the new building blocks that we need to think about how to get to the fuels and chemicals that we uh, have traditionally made from, from petrochemical sources. Okay, so just to give one example of a potential pathway, uh, the furans have gotten a lot of attention, uh, particularly for plastics. Uh, so, so in petrochemical processing, we use paraxylene here. Uh, top left, and we do partial oxidation to install acid groups on it, and then we can polymerize that to make polyethylene terephthalate. Uh, the proposed biomass derived uh, surrogate would be to take this hydroxymethyl furfural compound, which has aldehyde and alcohol to start on the furan ring, do similar partial oxidations to make a diacid again, and then you can make uh, polyethylene furoate, which has very similar uh, properties to, to PET. Uh, and, and so uh, just to, to give a sense of, of kind of the status here, uh, while, while this is pretty heavily studied, one of the challenges is that, that HMF here is actually very low yield. Uh, it really likes to keep degrading into the, the uh, acid products I showed at the bottom of the last slide. Uh, it's, it's still only really done at pilot scale. Uh, meanwhile, the other major furan uh, product, furfural, is uh, a little bit more stable. Uh, we already actually do uh, industrial production of furfural from lignocellulosic biomass at a few hundred thousand tons per year uh, scale. Uh, but one of the challenges there is there would be more post-processing to get to, to the FDCA uh, here. So, so what you can see is uh, with HMF, it's just one, one oxidation step uh, to get to uh, our FDCA, where on the bottom, uh, furfural would be oxidized to furolic acid, and then we would need uh, sort of a subsequent carboxylation to, to actually get to the FDCA. 
Uh, now, one of those citations down there on the bottom right, the Nature 2016, Matt Kanan's group showed uh, a very facile route to do this carboxylation. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a way to sort of sequester a little bit more CO2 along the way, uh, and, and it's, it's doable chemistry. Um, but, but in both of these oxidations, uh, the, the current routes are also still not quite established if we were going to do this on a larger scale. Uh, right now, the way that furoic acid is produced is by the Cannizzaro reaction, which is a disproportionation in strong base. So we, we put furfural in sodium hydroxide, we get an acid and an alcohol from the disproportionation, and then we reacidify that to get to furoic acid. So there's lots of pH swings and neutralizations. It's not the greenest uh, way to do this necessarily. Uh, at the scales we do it, it's not so much of a concern, but, but moving forward, if we were gonna go to 50 million tons a year, uh, we, would, we would wanna do this a little bit differently. Okay, so that's uh, kind of a, a high level picture of, of some of the feedstocks and just one example of, of a, a type of process we would wanna maybe uh, pursue. Uh, at the risk of dragging an introduction out too long, I'll just highlight a couple of the opportunities I see for electrocatalysis and then, and then move into some uh, more, more detailed stuff. So uh, as, as we mentioned, one of the challenges in biomass is the distributed nature of the, the feedstocks. Uh, and so, so running electrochemically gives you the advantage that you can work it under ambient conditions. You're a little less reliant on things like heat integration. Uh, and this, this leads to a more modular type of process uh, scaling. So uh, this is gonna be more compatible with tethering to renewables that are also gonna be scattered and, and the biomass resources that are gonna be scattered. Uh, it's, it's also gonna be directly compatible with some of these acidic aqueous feed streams that we are uh, going to be getting from our initial hydrolysis uh, steps or pyrolysis steps. Uh, electric, uh, electrochemistry also is going to let us take oxidizing or reducing reag or agents directly from water so we can generate reactive hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, we're not adding additional reagents for that. Uh, one of the interesting other things that we can do with electrochemistry could be considered a pro or a con, uh, but, but electrochemical processes come in pairs. We do an oxidation, we have to do a reduction. And so if we think about scaling up electrolysis and making lots and lots of hydrogen, uh, we will not have a commensurate demand for O2. And so in particular, we've been asking ourselves questions about what what are some of the valuable oxidative chemistries that we might pair with, with uh, hydrogen evolution? Of course, we could also run reductions to fuels uh, as well. And uh, one other thing I'll mention with electrochemistry, I don't wanna parse the figure down there too much, but, but basically there will be cases where we have steps, say like carbon-carbon bond scission that still want to proceed by a thermally uh, mediated pathway. We don't readily kind of exchange that with a, a, an alternative proton electron transfer type uh, uh, pathway. And so uh, there will be cases where we can sort of outrun one step with, with another by changing potential. Okay, so, so this is all to say, I think there are opportunities for electrochemistry in this space. Uh, today, I'm gonna to talk about upgrading furanics and particularly, I'm gonna focus on the case of furfural. Uh, despite the, the fairly applied motivation, uh, we, we do more fundamental stuff on, on model compounds. Uh, and this is all pretty exploratory work. It's, it's not really established chemistry that we're trying to improve. Uh, so, so our starting point is going to be to just try to understand the chemistry of furfural on some monometallic electrodes. Okay, so uh, in this crowd, most of us have probably seen a voltammogram of platinum before. Uh, this is our starting point just because we know it's, it's stable and it does oxidations. Uh, but so to the right is going to be oxidative conditions, right? That's where we're... Uh, Putting, putting hydroxyls and eventually oxidizing the platinum surface. Uh, and then in the, the left, the reducing potentials is where we will put hydrogen on our surface and be able to do reductions. 
And if I put the furfural molecule in here, we see a big oxidative wave. Uh, clearly, we're doing some chemistry to it. Uh, swinging in the other direction, there's also some, some reductive chemistry we do to furfural, but that will be uh, a topic for a different day. So on this oxidative side, we get a number of products. So you see a whole bunch of C4 and C5 oxygenates. Uh, and, and the task today is basically going to be to, to start to map out some of the interconnections between these, the, the more elementary steps that connect them. So to do this, uh, we have developed a relatively novel cell for electrochemistry. Uh, it, it's essentially just a, a packed bed differential reactor though. Uh, and, and this lets us run steady state kinetics. It, it's got a pretty high surface area to volume ratio with the flow. So we can do pretty rapid electrolysis at lots of different conditions uh, and, and study kinetics. A uh, couple novel features I'll point out. Uh, so, so of course we can collect effluent and do kind of standard analysis, uh, HPLC, NMR, things like that. Uh, we also couple with a, uh, a membrane inlet mass spec system. So we stick a, a capillary with a hydrophobic probe next to the, the catalyst bed and we can watch the more volatile and gaseous products coming off uh, live as, as we change conditions. And we can, we can get pretty rapid response time to that so we can do some more transient experiments. Okay, so just looking at some of the steady state product distributions, you can see here uh, some of those, those C4 and C5 oxygenates I mentioned. Uh, there's furoic acid, which might have some, some potential applications. Malaic acid also has, is frequently targeted in this, this chemistry for similar reasons of, of polymer uh, applications. Uh, but, but so over here on the right, uh, you'll see partial current densities to each of these products, and they're, they're organized by how many electron transfers would be involved just stoichiometrically to get to that product. So uh, if, you, if you prefer Faradaic efficiency, just take the partial currents and stretch them all to be the same height. Uh, but you can see uh, we, we get small amounts of current to furoic acid. It's the two electron product though. So in terms of the molar uh, contribution, it's, it's a little higher than what it would look like on the bottom or on the top rather. Uh, so the, the bottom graph is selectivity. Uh, that's, that's on the basis of the furfural conversion. Uh, and you can see that the majority is, is going to furoic acid at our lower potentials. Uh, and then as we get to higher potentials, we start getting some of this C4 in particular hydroxy uh, furanone product uh, cropping up. I'll also point to the black piece of the partial current on top. So this is kind of interesting. Uh, it's, it's not a substantial fraction of the carbon balance, but we, we get CO2 in quantity that is greater than the amount that goes from C5s to C4s. Uh, and what we eventually determine is this is a total oxidation pathway. So there's a kind of a parasitic current to really going deeply into overoxidation. And what's, what's most interesting about that is that we, we see no two or three carbon products. You get four, four and five carbon products or you get total oxidation. And so what, what exactly in the mechanism kind of causes that bifurcation uh, was, was an interesting question that we wanted to, to be able to understand more. Uh, so uh, to start really piecing together a mechanism, uh, we started off just by looking at how some of these different intermediates react. So you can just start putting in intermediates as your, your feed and seeing what comes out. Uh, so on the left here, we've got uh, the bottom is, is the products of furoic acid oxidation. And we see a lot of the same products in pretty similar proportions. Uh, the hydroxyfuroic goes away. So we, we see there's a, probably a fork in the road there. Uh, interestingly, if we were just kind of naively trying to connect these with sequential degrees of oxidation, so the two electron to the four electron to the six electron and so forth, um, the, the over oxidation to CO2 
does not seem to come from maleic acid. That's a pretty recalcitrant molecule. Uh, it's, it oxidizes very, very slowly. Uh, it, it turns out that that comes from somewhere earlier in the network. Uh, I'll, I'll mention we haven't done as extensive of, of characterization on, on some of these intermediates because they're expensive or not, in, in one case, can't even buy it. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, just, just kind of putting in, putting in various species and seeing what comes out, we can, we can start to draw a couple high level connections. Of course, we've said nothing about what's going on on the surface, what are some of the elementary steps that connect these things. And so to do that, uh, the first thing we did is, is turn to some infrared spectroscopy. So this is uh, a attenuated total reflectance cell. We're depositing our electrode on the silicon hemisphere over here, uh, schematically over here, bouncing an IR beam off of it and picking up some things that are, are in the near surface region. And so the voltammogram you see in the top right has a little yellow dot on it that corresponds to the potential uh, of the IR spectrum below. You can see a couple peaks down in a region that's associated with carbonyls. That's a, a pretty messy region when we do this chemistry. Uh, for the moment, I'll, I'll just point out there's some peaks that are associated with furfural itself. Uh, but one of the new things that pops up right away is a big, strong carbon monoxide signal. And this is happening at a potential where we're not really doing any turnovers, any, any steady state rate. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a neutral you know, point, point 0.4 versus RHE kind of condition. Uh, so then we start to raise the potential in the oxidative direction. Uh, actually, I'll comment so that that CO we would speculate would come from the aldehyde group decarbonylating uh, and, and leaving us with CO. Uh, and, and so we, we believe this may even just be thermally uh, mediated. It's, it's seen in, in other environments. Uh, but so now that we've established the CO uh, factor there, we're going to start pushing up the potential and we're going to see that CO at some point finally strips off. This is happening around 0 0.8, 0 0.9 volts. Uh, and this is where we really start to see our, our steady state chemistry happen. So uh, pushing our oxidative potential up, uh, the CO peak starts to drop and we start to see some other things evolving over in the carbonyl region. Uh, so there's quite a bit to parse here. Uh, I'm only going to point to a couple features. Uh, so if we, if we looked at this product distribution and just tried to say this peak shows up at a certain potential and I also see this product at that potential and try to make that correlation, uh, you would be led astray as we were. So the, the peak that looks pretty prominent at the highest potentials here, uh, on the, the left around 1700 where I'm hovering the cursor, uh, that turns out to be uh, a furoic acid peak, despite the fact that you know, furoic acid is most selective at much lower potentials. Uh, and the way we determine this is first of all, when we, when we ramp the potential back down, this peak actually sticks around uh, down to quite low potentials. And if, uh, we take a look back at our platinum voltammogram. We know there's some hysteresis and when it forms an oxide uh, and when it, it re-reduces. And so it, it would appear that we only see this peak when the platinum surface is oxidized. Uh, so to, to, this still doesn't really tell us anything about what the peak would be. Uh, we put furoic acid in the cell as the, the substrate we see there is a strong absorbance in that region, but of course we've got pure furolic acid around, so we see it at all potentials. Uh, interestingly, as we go to higher potential, that peak kind of suppresses and then comes back up. And, and so this was perplexing. We weren't sure if it was just a different product for a while, uh, but what we eventually settled on as an interpretation is that uh, there's some literature on other carboxylic acids, uh, on mainly on gold electrodes, so not directly the same system, but at around this potential region, there's a one electron oxidation that leads to a, a carboxylate 
that then wants to bind through the oxygens and kind of stand up on the surface. And so this, this was our interpretation. And the idea was once you go to oxide, that, that binding mode no longer is favorable uh, or, or no longer preferred. Uh, and so we start to see some of that original uh, furelic acid peak again. Uh, so we, we kind of went out on a limb uh, with that interpretation at the time that we published this paper. Uh, later on, we, we recently revisited this in a new IR cell that uses a very thin wafer silicon and lets us get down to lower wave numbers. And, and we see some of the stretches that were kind of off camera in the, the older data. So um, we, we can actually confirm with, with pretty good certainty that that's a, that's a furylate uh, related peak. Okay, so then uh, there's a few other features going on here. When we take the furfural away by starting with furelic acid, you see there's another product peak that's, that was kind of hidden underneath the furfural. Uh, that's related to one of the furanone products we think just by kind of adding that to the cell and seeing where its, its peaks are. Uh, and, and there's kind of a shoulder that shows up in, in the, the furelic acid peak that we think is associated with the hydroxyfuranone. But at, at some point, there's just too many things happening all in a tight region of the spectrum. Uh, and if, if we really, you know, we could start to make some speculative uh, assertions about the mechanism based on on what we've, we've observed in the IR so far. I'm not gonna parse this, this figure with the time we have, uh, but uh, what, we, what we did was turn to some modeling work with a collaborator uh, to try to fill in some of the gaps. So, you know, IR can tell us some things, but it's, it's not gonna tell us uh, every, every minor elementary step. Uh, and so uh, what, I'm, what I'm showing here is some work done by Mike Janik's group over at Penn State. Uh, what they did is, is essentially uh, you know, ask the question, if I oxidize at a certain point on the molecule, what's the, the energy change and barrier associated with that? And then kind of say among, among the various initial activation steps from whichever one is most favorable, we'll work from there uh, just because there's, there's so many possible steps. Uh, but so, so they determine it's, it's almost certainly the first uh, easiest step to just pull off the aldehyde hydrogen. Uh, so we're gonna assume that that's our starting point. Uh, but then what, what Mike's group determined next is that, so, so we can add a hydroxyl and get to furelic acid. Uh, we can decarbonylate as the IR suggested, losing that CO. Uh, but what, what they pointed out was that you can actually also decarboxylate the furelic acid and get down to the same intermediate and, and the energetics are pretty similar. So kind of regardless of whether we form furelic acid or not, we, we think we kind of reconverge at the same uh, furyl intermediate. Now, one, one caveat to these, these calculations is this, is this is just computational hydrogen electrode correction, still in vacuum, uh, no, no solvent or anything like that. So, uh, and, and we're not looking at the oxidized platinum surface. So this is gonna be descriptive when we're talking about things happening at 0.8 or 0.9 volts, but not necessarily at the really elevated voltages. Uh, okay, but so to, to pull a little bit more of the mechanism out then, uh, it, it appears pretty easy to add a hydroxyl to that, that furyl intermediate. Uh, we've never seen the, the product there but it goes into equilibrium with the furanones. So it's a, it's a homogeneous equilibration that happens kind of after it comes off the surface. That's our, that's our hypothesis. Um, from there, you would get to some more of the C4 products. Mike's group also finds that there's a, a pathway where you, you keep the, the C5s and, and get to the hydroxyfurelic acid. And there may be an alternate pathway with some ring opening on the surface that also could get us to the C4. So there may be two different ways to get there. Um, we haven't fully probed all of it, but, but this is what they, they tell us some of the pathways would be. Okay, so it at least lends some credence to the, the furyl intermediate in particular and, and really backs up the, the observation of the decarbonylation uh, from, from IR. 
So this idea of decarboxylating kind of led us to reevaluate a little bit of our uh, IR data. And so I want to revisit this CO peak in the furoic acid spectrum because in furfural, it was it seemed quite logical that you could lose the, the carbonyl CO and, and end up with, with CO on the surface. Uh, in the case of furoic acid, uh, the, the source, the, the, the way by which you would end up with CO is a little less straightforward because you should lose CO2. Uh, so the, the realization was that the, the ring is probably not as stable as we had thought. And, and you could basically do decarboxylation and then have CO actually derived from the ring rather than the, the side group. Uh, and so you would break down into a CO and maybe some kind of propyl fragment. Uh, so just to kind of summarize what, what we're speculating so far, we think that there's kind of these convergent pathways that get us divergent and then reconvergent pathways that get us to a fural species. Uh, and this is kind of a gateway to the, the C4 products. Uh, we've, we've established some speculative ways that some of these interconnect with calculations through Mike's group. If we had infinite time and resources, we'd be doing lots and lots of isotope tracing and things like that to really get at every aspect of this. Uh, but, but the next piece of the puzzle that, that we focused on uh, was the overoxidation and kind of understanding where that comes from. So where in this pathway do things really break down and, and lead to that, that uh, high CO2 production? So to look at this, we come back to the flow cell and we're going to do some transient experiments. So this is stripping voltammetry. It's much like a TPD, but we're, we're ramping voltage instead of potential. So we're going to flow our organic over the catalyst. We're going to let it absorb for some time, and then we're going to flush the cell. So we've got some organic stuck to our catalyst surface, and we're going to ramp the potential, and we're going to watch the mass spec signal for CO2 synchronized with the oxidative current. So we're looking at current on the top and the mass spec signal for CO2 on the bottom. Now, uh, what you'll notice is there's these two uh, kind of separate bumps, kind of uh, peaks in the CO2 signal. Uh, we could almost immediately suspect that the first one is the stripping of CO, because we know that should happen at around 0.8 volts, uh, and we know CO should be on the surface. So that's a little bit more evidence of, of this uh, decarbonylation. And we can confirm that further by letting the molecule sit for progressively longer amounts of time. Uh, if, we, if we really let this uh, equilibrate before we do the stripping, uh, it, it turns out that, that our, our two oxidative features, if we integrate the CO2, come out in a four to one ratio. So that would be four carbons on the ring, one, one carbon per CO. And uh, to, to illustrate it further, we can put CO directly into the cell. Uh, we, we get that earlier sharp peak. Obviously when it's pure CO, it's a much sharper stripping feature than when there's other organics on the surface. Uh, but, but this tracks with the earlier peak. Uh, and then the furan molecule, which is not a great proxy for, for furyl intermediates, but but nonetheless, it, it kind of tracks with that broader, higher potential oxidation uh, that would, would go along with some of the C4s. Uh, so then we repeat this exercise with, with all of our model compounds that we can get our hands on uh, and, and do the same basic experiment. Again, trying to probe this, this question of where the breakdown point in the mechanism is that goes to total over oxidation. And uh, we, we collect that. So on the right-hand side, the solid curve is the, the uh, Faradaic current. The dotted line is the mass spec. Uh, they're scaled for visibility, so the relative heights don't, don't really mean anything. Um, and, and what we can see, so if there's, if there's separation between the curves, uh, that would correspond to doing oxidations that are not producing CO2. And when the curves are really close together, then there's more CO2 being produced. So one of the features that really stands out in this is with the hydroxyfuranone, 
we get a very similar kind of pre pre peak or, or early peak uh, where we get the same kind of like double pump that we see in the furfural uh, spectrum. And, and so we thought, well, so some of this could be CO on the surface as well. And so our, our current uh, hypothesis is we know that hydroxyfurinone is in equilibrium uh, in solution phase, it's in equilibrium with this uh, uh, beta acrylic, formal acrylic acid. Uh, and it, that's a, yet a terminal aldehyde. And so we think that it could decarbonylate in the same way that furfural decarbonylates. Uh, so if we, if we did this isomerization on the surface, we could just cleave the CO if it's terminal. And then what we're left with is a, an unsaturated carboxylate. So this is going to be very susceptible to just oxidizing all the way to CO2. Um, so, so we think that this is possibly why you either get a C4 or you get all CO2 product. Okay, so, so that's the, the juncture in the mechanism where we think the overoxidation happens. Uh, I'm noticing I'm already at 40 minutes. So I'm gonna try to highlight one other thing in about five or less, and then we can do, we can do questions. Uh, so we, we can kind of classify different regions of the, the operating conditions in terms of what the predominant products are. We can talk a little bit about what some of the predominant surface species are under these various conditions. Uh, and, and so then the question becomes, how do we sort of steer the selectivity? Uh, you know, platinum was just a, a starting point, uh, a case study. Uh, so, so one thought was if, if we're getting lots of these carbon cleavage steps, uh, you know, if we move to something more noble like gold, could we expect really high yields of furylic acid? Uh, could we play with bimetallics in a way to either kind of sterically hinder the ring from laying down and doing the decarbonylation? Or could we move into some of these so-called bifunctional oxidative catalysts that uh, might help us clear CO off the surface faster and so allow us to do turnovers at lower potentials? Uh, so the, the answer on gold is yes, it makes lots of furelic acid. It makes furelic acid almost exclusively until very high potential. And uh, it actually does so at much higher rates than platinum. So this is normalized per, per gold site. And uh, it, it starts off much, much faster. Uh, but there's a catch, uh, which is that it poisons pretty quickly. So if we, if we do some concentration dependent studies, uh, what we find in the furelic acid oxidation, or sorry, in, in the furfural oxidation to furelic acid, if we start with really low concentrations of furfural. So these, these clusters of three are 10 millimolar, 50 millimolar, 100 millimolar. Uh, when we get down to 10 millimolar, the Faradayic efficiency to the furelic acid drops off and it gets replaced by the C4 product. Uh, so what this led us to speculate is that it, at higher concentrations where we're gonna have higher coverages, we think that these, these furylate species that we talked about before essentially start to stack and self-assemble and, and form a very uh, high coverage dense layer. And then we're always limited by desorption of, of the furylate. Uh, but at, at some lower concentration conditions, this thing can kind of lay down and actually uh, still get cleaved on the gold surface. So, uh, the, the confirmation of the, the Furo 8 is pretty straightforward with IR. You get a pretty much monolayer coverage and there's four peaks that are uh, pretty cleanly assignable. Since we don't go into deep oxidation of the surface, we're more comfortable just assigning these from, from DFT. So this is some more stuff Janik helped us out with. Uh, but, but that seems to be the case. Uh, so it's, it's pretty straightforward on gold uh, and if we, if we start off with furoic acid at, at high concentrations, it, the surface is basically just shut down. Uh, we get a little bit of maleic acid product, but there's basically just, uh, and it's at quite high potentials in comparison. 
so, so we think that we form this kind of self-inhibiting uh, product layer. And, and to illustrate that a little bit more, you can do uh, some, just some uh, addition of furoic acid. So, so by just putting in 1% or 10% furoic acid, we can see the oxidative feature just get suppressed. So, so basically by the time you've done about 10% conversion, uh, the rates have, have fallen off to, to nil on, on gold. Okay, so this is just kind of a summary comparing the two, the two cases and, and how in the case of gold, we think we have a different poisoning problem. Maybe poisoning is not quite the right word, but a different intermediate uh, accumulation problem. I'll comment very, very briefly on the idea of the, the direction in bifunctionals. There's a paper citation down there that I can point people to um, talking about some of the issues with this. Basically, we found that it does take CO off the surface at really low potentials, but it also just overoxidizes anyway. We think that, that uh, the, the oxophilic sites in the, the platinum ruthenium bifunctional catalyst actually activate carbon. Um, and, and that's uh, one of the reasons that it's, it's less effective for what we were hoping. Um, but I can, I can talk about that more if, if people have questions on it. Um, I should wrap up because I'm running long. Uh, so I, I'll just acknowledge my, my research group. They're the ones who do the work. Uh, in, in particular, uh, Alex Roman, who did the vast majority of this stuff uh, and graduated last year. So he's in the center there. This is obviously a dated picture at this point. Uh, Joe Hassey also is doing a lot of the IR work. Uh, and then I'll, I'll thank Mike Janik and some funding from NSF and, and collaborators at NREL. And we've got some time for questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Adam, for that really comprehensive and um, fundamental talk. So now feel free to um, put your questions in the chat or if you just put X, then you can ask your question directly. Um, Nitish, did you want to moderate the question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll let, yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. Maybe I can start off with a question. So you mentioned some interesting techno-economic analyses, and, and that was feeding in hydrogen, right? Are you aware of any similar analyses for the electrocatalytic routes? So the, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There, you know, there's there's some there's some reasonable TEAs done for like CO2 reduction at this point, but uh, for for the biomass uh, pathways, this is actually kind of a point of contention with my NREL friends when we were writing the review. Uh, the 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 issue is it's just so premature that that getting good numbers for most of the inputs is the, the range makes the output almost meaningless. So, so it's the, the perspective is it's, it's exploratory and we need to just play with materials and conditions and kind of see uh, what, get, get some more realistic uh, bounds on, you know, what the, uh, what the realistic yields and and uh, so forth are going to be. So there's some there's some really high level numbers in that paper that are just like, if we run it, say the cell is two volts and I want to make so for a, a small uh, production facility. So we used corn ethanol as like a benchmark, which is something like uh, a few hundred kilomole per hour or something like that. Uh, if you wanted to make a product at the same rate uh, from an electrochemical process and you ran at like a certain voltage and turn that into current. We, we do some estimates in terms of how much solar land or how much wind land you would need to power that. And, and they're, they're actually quite high. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the short answer is that if you wanted to just build a field with renewable inputs specifically for this outlet, um, the economics would be pretty uh, unfavorable. 
if you wanted to use this as more of a, a mechanism to deal with electricity that you would be curtailing, maybe because we're getting to really high renewable penetration on the grid and we've got spikes and, and need somewhere to put it. Um, and then they're more viable, but then there's a different question, which is if we have certain production targets, uh, is there really going to be that much curtailed electricity? Uh, and, and that's where they, again, get into these, there's just too many scenarios. And, and so they, there was some pushback in terms of, I just can't give you a number. Uh, but, but yeah, that's, those are some of the considerations that, that go into it. Uh, great. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, first one is from Sehang. Uh, you can unmute yourself and then ask the question. Okay. Hi, Adam. Okay. Uh, I think it's very nice, comprehensive uh, talk. Yes, actually, I'm working, also working on the furfural, but I'm working on furfural reduction. But uh, concerning the uh, electrical oxidation part, I have one question is that um, bes uh, um, besides gold and, and platinum, and do you try other materials like some oxides? Uh, so we have not, I'm aware of a few studies that have. Uh, so, so there's one in particular, I'm, I'm struggling to remember the authors, but they, they found on like a lead oxide or something like that, that they get pretty high maleic acid yields. And so that's, that's, it's exciting from the perspective of the product that they're getting. Um, you know, we, I uh, just for logistic resources, you know, pick, pick your reason. We just haven't gotten into that broad of a, a uh, scanning of material space. And, and since we tend to do a little deeper dive mechanistically, uh, picking a new material is, is kind of an undertaking uh, where if, if we were just kind of tossing them in and seeing the products, we could probably scan a little more broadly. Uh, so yeah. I, I'm aware of some of that work and uh, it, it's interesting for sure. Uh, I just, it, it's also, I, I will mention much harder to do ATR spectroscopy with those kinds of things. So yeah. we take advantage of the Sierra effect and so platinum and, and gold are very well behaved films. Uh, so yeah, uh, totally agree. Yeah, we, we're, we're almost, we're picking the materials to be more compatible with the techniques. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. At this stage, it's just kind of developing some some baselines in terms of what some of the pathways are. But yeah, I I agree. There's a huge material space out there that that would be interesting to, to get yeah. into. And, and can go back to your first part of the uh, talk. Yes, yeah. I think it's basic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we can. Yeah, maybe we can sh stop at maybe the two. Yeah, let's two, I think, the following two one. Yeah, yeah I actually, yeah, I think the, the question is very broad. That's, that's about the uh, the pH applied in your uh, oxidation um, process. Do you see any kind of pH dependence for your activity or sectivity? Yeah, so uh, we, ha we only ran this in acid. I, I have some very, very new stuff where we've run in more neutral conditions. But the, the issue, so, so there's a couple things. Uh, in strong base, you do Canizaro chemistry, which is one of those pathways I mentioned at the beginning. So, so basically there's a homogeneous process that, that will, will uh, just start giving you furfural alcohol and furoic acid there. So if, if you run dilute and run it fast enough, you can kind of do the electrochemistry before that takes over too much. Um, but, but we avoided it for that reason. And, and we also were, were coming from the kind of motivation that the feedstocks will be an acid. So uh, for that reason, we, again, we focus on the low pH conditions. I, I, I wish that I had more to tell you about the, the pH effects specifically, but um, the, the, those were our reasons for focusing on acid. Okay, thank you, great. Um, yeah, we have uh, another question from James Burrow, and the question is, have you looked at double layer effects that have been shown to influence um, CO2 reduction and things like cations and field at the interface that controls adsorption? Do you think, I think this is called Zeeman effect, and you might be able to see some of the peak shifts in the infrared spectroscopy. 
Okay, so that I think there's two questions in there. Uh, so, so we definitely use Stark effect mm -hmm. uh, to get some more confirmation on the peaks. Uh, and and Mike Janik's group will, has done some, you know, field putting the putting the adsorbate in different fields. Uh, there's the the paper on the gold. If you dig through the SI, there's some discussion of the Stark effect and kind of matching up the peaks with a little bit more there. Um, on the more general question about looking at, at ion effects, uh, so for oxidations, uh, they're a little bit less well established and, and pronounced. It would be an anion effect rather than a cation effect, probably. Uh, in some of our reduction work, which is not out yet, uh, we have observed this, and it's it's uh, it can play a role both one in suppressing hydrogen evolution, um, two, uh, it actually has some favorable effects with regard to electropolymerization, which in the reduction chemistries is a big big problem. Uh, so uh, we we have some speculations about kind of how the uh, how radical anions would be stabilized in in different electrolyte environments and uh, all I will say at the moment is is yes we're we're looking into that with regard to reductions not so much oxidations uh, but other than kind of broad broad strokes on what types of things we're thinking about I, I don't have data sets to show you today Great. Um, okay, uh, another question from Sudarshan Vijay. Uh, great talk. I was wondering if it is possible to extract adsorption energies or rate constants of the reaction from the potential program desorption experiments analogous to what one would do with temperature program desorption. Uh, it's definitely possible. One challenge, I think, is that the product distribution changes so if, if I start off at low potential, uh, I'm letting the molecule kind of do thermal chemistry on the surface. And so it ends up decomposing and giving me some monoxide and some other organic fragments. And, and so the, I'm not sure it would be representative of what's going on at higher potential. Like, I don't think we actually go through CO as an intermediate uh, at the, the higher potentials. So for that reason, we haven't pursued that too much. If it was, if it was a little cleaner, like I, I would actually say in the case of gold, that might be more viable because it doesn't uh, give us such a multitude of products and, and so much changing products with conditions. Uh, so, so that would be interesting to do in that case. But, but I think the platinum is just you know, we, we built this differential reactor with all these very high hopes of doing these, these uh, detailed kinetic studies and getting all the reaction orders and rate constants. And um, I think the reality is it's, it's just, it's such a very messy system uh, between the, the kind of uh, distribution of different intermediates that are there and then the platinum changing into an oxide in the middle of the region that we care about uh, that it, it's just a lot more time and energy than we've we've had to throw at it at this point. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, if there's any more questions, you can post it in the chat. Um, yeah, related to that, maybe I, I had a question. So uh, we actually had N Nirala speak a, a few weeks back in the in the webinar series, and he's done a lot of work on trying to understand adsorption energies in aqueous phase and how they're so different from adsorption energies that you would have in ultra high vacuum. And that has to do a lot with competitive water adsorption. And I was wondering if, have you thought like in, in that direction and in terms of looking at that for furfural and how that would, for instance, look on a platinum surface, like how different would the adsorption energies be and things like that? Uh, yeah, so uh, I, know, I know all about Nerala's work. It's really neat to, you know, you, you think about in, this, in the case of absorbing on the surface, you also have to kind of desolvate the surface to a certain extent. And, um, 
we we have not spent much time thinking about that. I think it would, you know, that's that's something we would probably ask uh, one of our, our computational collaborators to do. Uh, Mike's group ran a, a few limited calculations with with solvent turned on. Mm -hmm. um, the, the the basic uh, conclusion was just like we don't see really differential effects. Mm -hmm. So they, like all the all the species tend to shift in a similar direction, and they don't think there will be mechanistic changes. So in terms of getting things like accurate numbers, that's definitely going to be a, a necessary thing to think about. Um, in terms of whether there would be like one intermediate that's much more highly influenced than another to where it totally changes the pathway, their their initial assessment was they don't think so. But I, I you know, truthfully, I, I can't give you a, a I, I would not assert that. Yeah, maybe with furfural, it's not that big of an issue, but definitely, I mean, for things like phenol and benzaldehyde, like if you do the calculations just in vacuum, you would always predict that the desorption is limiting just because they just bind so strongly. But if you do, if you account for this water penalty, then you you would actually find that the, the adsorption energies are shifted so much up. I mean, that of course depends to a large extent on what metal surface you're looking at. Um, and it's always nice to get some uh, some of these numbers with experiments, because we can always do our computations, do molecular dynamics and things like that. But in the end, it would always be nice if we can yeah, yeah. Part time with, yeah. Definitely. Um, so in, in the case, in both cases here, I think we're in strongly desorption limited regimes mm -hmm. by, by for, for different reasons. Like on, on gold, yeah. we have that kind of self-reinforcing uh, uh, self-assembled monolayer situation. Mm -hmm. Platinum just really overbinds. Yeah. Um, I so so I I don't think that turning on solvation would change the rate limiting step in right. these particular cases, just based on the the kinetic signatures that we have. I I also think be, because we're we 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 came into this working at very high concentration in comparison to like what organic electrochemists typically work with, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, we're almost always looking at saturation regime where you, you know it's like just being at a massive pressure uh, and you have to go pretty dilute to start seeing where, where the isotherm starts to drop off. Mm -hmm. and, and that brings us into analytical challenges. So you know if you, if you start off with 10 millimolar or one millimolar reactant and then you're only making a few percent of a certain product, we start losing those products just because the analytical is not our, you know, our capabilities are not quite there. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think it would be great to do these really, you know, over multiple orders of magnitude uh, types of, of kinetic studies. Mm -hmm. uh, we've just hit some practical limitations in, in being able to do all the, the analytical chem. Great. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the answer. Yeah. So I, I guess we are running out of time. So, probably a good time to stop right now and um yeah so th thanks all all for attending and then uh so adam we can uh chat on the other link that i i sent you with, with some people. Take 10 minutes and then okay. yeah you can take a 10 minute break and then we can meet yeah. 20 minutes to recap a little and discuss sounds good i'll, I'll meet you over there in a few okay. yeah